chance to another edition of Tiffin Box TV. I'm your host Seishu, and speaking today, I'm speaking today with R.J. Kern, a wedding photographer extraordinaire, really based in Minneapolis. And he and I connected recently on one of the social media platforms. I can't even remember which. It was Facebook or Twitter. But I was really intrigued by his personal projects. And this guy spends a good deal of time away from just weddings to making images for himself. And I wanted to see what he can tell us about why he does that and how he does that. So welcome, RJ. Thanks for joining me today. Oh, thank you, Seishu. I appreciate you having me on your show. Big yeah. time, long time caller, first time caller, I guess you can call it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Hey, uh, you know, let's let's just jump right into these these personal projects you've been working on. Your, your wedding portraits, are, and first of all, you're a destination wedding photographer. You've gone all over the world. Uh, your background is interesting, too. Uh, I've been reading, you, you've spent a good deal of time with National Geographic. Um, I mean, which photographer doesn't want to do that, right? <laughs> so talk a little bit about your background, and then we'll come back to the, the personal projects in a second. Tell us about how you got involved with the National Geographic. What did you do for them? Sure thing. I was a, I started off as an intern, um, literally the day out of college, and I studied geography and fine arts and had a double major, and I, I knew I needed a, some sort of a career launch. Um, getting started as an artist can sometimes be a challenge, but I love geography. And so I started off in Washington, D.C., um, in the news division of their website, nationalgeographic.com. I wrote some amazing stories, uh, interviewed some amazing people, wrote, and um, Jane Goodall and Bob Ballard, who found the Titanic and, and so on, and um, really kind of was exposed to uh, the upper echelon, if you will, of photographers. And um, several of them took me under their belt and encouraged me uh, to pursue um, my interests and they sure. say yeah I think you've got something to share and uh, so I, I worked as a cartographer as a staff position for five years and um, it was an amazing ex experience um, again that was like my day job for so many years and I, as I kind of slowly it was circa 2000 2005 sure. Sure. And, um, and, and through that it really afforded me opportunities to focus in on my photography building uh, business stage, which takes quite a quite a while to build your platform and um, experience and clientele, and um, went full time um, several years ago, and this is my ninth season shooting weddings. Awesome. So interestingly, you had a day job, let's say, and on when the time permitted, you were able to go out and make images for yourself. So you were you were already sort of doing a personal, sort of pursuing personal projects along the way. I mean, it's not like you decided one day I'm going to stop making images for myself. You've been doing that for a while, right? I've been a huge proponent of um, maintaining advanced uh, hobbyist status in photography sure. for a long time. <laughs> you know, the moment money crosses hands, um, it begins to kind of muck up things. Yeah. And so um, when I went full time, I realized like much like exercising and eating healthy, like I need to take care of my creative soul. And otherwise, I'm going to be no good for myself in five years, 10 years. And my clients will see it. My business will steadily decline. Um, I I also have a fine arts background. I mean, I don't. I didn't get into photography because of weddings, and so it was paying respect to that. Um, half the time of making art is is the process, mm -hmm. and uh, that that process takes me outside, which I love. Um, and interacting with nature, as, as cliche as it has, is it is it's, it's very therapeutic as well. Right. And um, I think all humans can stand benefit more time outside and less time in front of these computer things, uh, but it's a necessary evil. Yeah. And so it gives me something to look forward to in the off season, to think about, to plan. Um, and uh, the project kind of slowly evolved. Um, and to the point now, now, I've got several fine art exhibitions coming up and a oh, portfolio excellent. review. So yeah. Excellent. Give us an idea of, of, of the projects you've worked in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell, tell, tell us about the kinds of things that you just said. Oh, well, the season's just wrapped up. I'm going to go off and do what? You know? Sure, sure. Um, 2010 was a big year for me. It was, uh, I went to Burning Man, and that was as a visual culture. It was the world's largest outdoor art festival. And um, some quality time with some world-renowned photographers. So it was, it, a big part of it started in 2010 when I went to Burning Man, and that was a phenomenal experience in terms of where you can create art and money doesn't exchange hands. 
And so creating portraits um, of people, that's a big part of tying into who I was as a wedding photographer. And, and that kind of scaled itself to the point where it created a lot of joy in taking pictures and sharing my talents. Now, do you go every year? Uh, I went every other year, so this is my um, three three different uh, times: okay. uh, 2000, 2012, and fourteen. Okay, and I see on your website it's uh, Burning Man 2014 Part Seven: Couples in <laughs> Love. So I'm assuming there are several different parts to your project. Um, obviously, you're financing these on your own. Uh, you know, thanks to a fairly busy uh, wedding season that allows you to be able to go out and and, and do these projects. Correct. 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 So, and yeah, tell us a little bit about like how do you like mentally say, well, okay, I'm going to put away X amount of dollars for this project. I mean, how, you know, you know, doing a project sounds uh, sounds like a wonderful idea, but most people don't sit and plan it. I think correct. that's that's the problem. You know, they all think, okay, well, I'm going to do this, but then this sort of shows up next day, and you can't really do it. You know, exactly. And, and you have to sort of think about, oh, I'm going to go to Burning Man. Um, two years from now, and I'm going to need, you know, a certain amount of money to be able to make it out there and survive and all these other things. And of course, and then you have to think about the, the portraits, how they're going to be presented, right? Correct. Correct. So no, how a, do you, tell us a little bit about your thought process and making all of that happen for you. I think the big thing is following your heart and listening to your heart and saying, okay, you know, this is something I need to do. Okay. Uh, I think it's easy when life gets busy to make excuses why we, we can't carve that time out. Um, and it's, uh, I, I made mention earlier in the conversation about exercise or eating right and taking care of yourself. Um, if those don't become a priority, everything else will slip in our life. Yeah. And so as a creative person, um, I feel like, yeah, this year I need to go. And um, it, it, it wasn't a forced mechanism. Um, granted, I needed to plan, and uh, a lot of as creatives, a lot of times planning is a very difficult thing because you have to say no to things. Like um, it's always surrounding Labor Day weekend, and you know that's a busy weekend for wedding photographers. And so there's that commitment to prioritize. Okay, sure. am I going to stay stay through the whole event? Do I need to leave early, et cetera, et cetera? Right. Um, so that's the first thing I think from a budgeting perspective. I've always got a pretty good idea in the back of my mind, you know, and it pluses in how am I up, am I down, you know, allocating funds accordingly. Um, obviously, there's your travel. Um, I think the most important thing underlooked in pursuing any sort of personal project is, is solid insurance because, uh -huh. you know, you're, you're putting your gear out there, um, you're putting yourself out there, and, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I'm going to take a bunch of random pictures of people, but what if something happens? Um, and that, that's something that um, I think helps to build confidence to knowing that you know, I can take out a medium format digital camera. If something happens, it gets caught in a dust storm. You know, I've got insurance that I'm not afraid to bring my good camera. Does that make sense? Yes, that absolutely makes sense. And I was just thinking about that because Burning Man is not, you know, it's 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 out in the desert and you are going to get hit by a sandstorm or or whatever, you know, like it can happen and you exactly. have to you have to be prepared for it. Um tell us a little bit about this this project uh which you posted about called The Year of the Sheep or Goat. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's it, it, the it's the first thing I saw on your website that goes what is this guy doing? He's taking out his strobes out in the in the wild and photographing these these very sort of scary looking sheep. I, I call them artistically neglected animals. I mean, let's face it, you know, they're not as exotic. <laughs> um, many people find them to be a nuisance, in fact, oh, yeah? and because uh, um, they eat everything in, in sight, right? Oh, indeed, and they'll stand in the middle of the road, and they can do a number to your car if you're not careful um, if you're driving fast. So. <laughs> No, I think um, drawing on a lot of my inspiration in school and studying uh, composition and paintings, like quintessential European landscape paintings, um, have a certain painterly light. And as photographers, I'm, I'm drawn to light, much like Rembrandt's light. And I, you know, that's, that inspires and informs my approach. Um, so I was like, I wonder if I can create some of these hmm. visions in my head that are kind of paintings, but, and I really started to kind of get into the nuances. I mean, I'm creating art, um, and that part of that takes intention, and intention with 
okay, I've got to bring stuff to make my project happen, whether Absolutely. it be a paintbrush or a certain kind of lighting um, and plan for it. And, and then the other big part of that psychology is understanding that you've got your intent. But you have to also be open to what I call happy mistakes. Um, I don't know. If it, so, uh, Stacia, have you ever had like a watercolor painting class? I have, a long time ago, yes. So, And you know what happens if you try to put the watercolor down and you try to control it too much. Right. You can frustrate yourself sure. um, and the medium doesn't flow. And so that's, I think, a big part of any personal project is you have to be able to react and, and just work with it. It's like learning how to surf. If you try to fight the wave, it's just going to pummel you versus sure. have to roll out of something. Sure. Um, and so being reactive, I think, is um, important, but being proactive, I think, is more important. So if you're driving along you know, a road from point A to point B and the light is amazing, you know, I have my sleeping bag in the back of the car that I'm not having to hit up a, you know, a hotel and check into a B&B. I can sleep in the back of my car. Sure. And I'm going to stay here and shoot for the evening. Sure. Um, and so it's that part of flexibility okay. that allows me to be outside more. Um, the one thing to you too, I'll say, is these aren't necessarily expensive trips. Um, I recently got back from Iceland in the fall, and I spent a week there shooting. Um, my budget, including airfare, was $1,500. Okay? And that was a portion of the proceeds from the sale of a fine art show months before. So trying to keep, okay, you know, the, the money separate. And you're talking about making commitment. So if you make money in the fine art sale, try to roll that back into the fine art. Oh, as opposed to, you know, the, 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 the day job pays yeah. the bills and insurance and food and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but it's important to separate the art as well because to keep that momentum rolling requires some financial um, to make it worthwhile. Otherwise, you're like, you know what? I, I, I'm not going to do anything this year. Sure, you know? sure. So that's, that's a little bit how I, I justify some of these trips. And then, of course, you can t write off a good portion of that trip come tax time. That's always helpful as well. Sure. Uh, where were these pictures uh, shot of the sheep? Yeah, Norway, Ireland, and Iceland. And it's okay. over a three-year period. Okay. Uh, as I'm kind of tracing my, call it family's genetic homeland. So tell us a little bit about you know, you know, you've given us great advice on on pursuing these personal projects, uh, you know, the advice on, about you know, f financing your your projects from uh, the sale of a of a previous I guess personal project and rolling it into another personal project is just gold. I love that. What other piece of advice would you suggest for photographers who are aching to really do something, whether it's the off season or even during the on season when things are a little slow and you can go out there and do things differently for yourself? I mean, there are opportunities everywhere. So what do you suggest? I think listening to your heart is huge. Um, that, that cannot be underlooked. Um, a lot of personal projects evolve from some passion outside of the photography realm, whether it be being involved in a community, um, helping a cause, mm -hmm. uh, sharing inspiration, or maybe just exploration in a visual art. Sure. Um, and not to underlook that, I mean, realizing that, that there's some golden nuggets there in terms of creativity, exploration, thinking critically, um, playing with tools, learning new techniques, all of that can kind of roll in and help and inform um, your full-time work, so to speak. And I think there is a, a certain dovetail that happens when you show that personal work. You'll oftentimes, as Chase Jarvis would once say, you know, create, share, sustain that model of creativity. Right. Um, if you're showing the work you want to shoot, chances are you're going to have more opportunities to do that. So what I'm hearing you say is that you pursue personal projects also for a reason, which is to keep, to keep sharp. To be exactly. able to, to to be able to go out there and and stay you know in the in the zone <laughs> as it were you know beyond weddings you know where you have to be consistently uh, you know aware of of where for, for for in this example and I'm looking at them like these three sheep all looking back at me <laughs> you know the fact is you have to be there in, in a you have to be there you have to be actually there and and ready for the moment and and it's not so different from photographing a wedding where you're actually, you know, anticipating something happening in front of you and you're constantly getting in, 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 in a zone where you are starting to be aware of 
elements coming into your frame, right? Am I am I Well you can't you can't pose a goat or a sheep like you can a bride. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But so well, not... it depends on the kind of wedding you're photographing, I guess, you know. <laughs> some some weddings you don't you don't pose people and some people some weddings you do. Um but the way I like to look at it is it's almost like I'm giving I'm treating this goat or this sheep or the, this this normal animal it sure. could be a squirrel for them and treat him like okay this is your cover shoot for vanity fair uh, <laughs> and realizing like there's a photojournalistic quality that sure. you have everything set locked and loaded but then you're looking for that moment yeah. and that's 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 keeping skills sharp that's mm -hmm. huge uh, and also I, I like to say say you is not being afraid to laugh at yourself I mean you realize like I'm running up and down hills chasing these farm animals with rubber boots on and <laughs> you know yeah. so um, it's important to have that sense of humor and not take ourselves too seriously because um, let's face it I mean we're in the we're technical people for so many yeah. and um, I think when we care about something it can also you can overthink things if you will and so I think it's important just like say, all right I have two days uh, per year and I'm gonna not put a lot of pressure on myself I'm just gonna go out and explore I've got a, a loose idea of things that I like to do, and then just being open for that moment. Um, and I mean, I, the, 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 the body of images, I, all of them were created at about 10 days, spread out over the course of three years. Yeah. So it's not a whole lot of actual no. busy time, right, you know? Right, yeah. um, marketing the images, printing the images, framing the images, <laughs> transporting the images. That actually can also be a fun distraction as well. Sure. So excellent, um, RJ. You know, it's it's inspiring to see uh, you so active and and so just involved in whatever it is. You're you're just you're you're like the consummate image maker in a way, where you're out there making images all the time. You know, um, and you've made the time for that to happen, and you've made the effort for that to happen. I think people need to understand that you've got to do both you know be able to produce a body of work uh and and the end goal is yes you're going to have a body of work but the end goal is you're going to be a much better photographer after you do something like exactly. this you know and, and i like to think that you'll do more in 11 months than you ever will in 12 months and having the f support of friends and family is huge i can't underplay that you know, allowing that time to take off to create that, sure. um, that 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 work, and a lot of times my family comes with me, or I can piggyback a wedding off of personal work, um, and that is, you know, I'm always trying to keep that sustainability model in mind. Like, will I still be able to shoot weddings in 20 years? I don't know. Will I still be able to do personal work in this project? And I look at, I'm kind of in the infancy of this project too. I'm in year three of a 10 year project, okay. um, and so having that longer longitudinal um, perspective and like, hey, maybe one day I want to do a fine art a, a book. Yeah. You know? um, so that's kind of the mentality. Awesome. Uh, when when it comes down to it, I know it's, you've talked about you know you being a photographer for the next 10, 15, 20 years or whatever, and then focusing on these personal projects all the time. Uh, but you, you know, in, in a way, you're you're conditioning your mind and your body to be doing these projects almost all the time now, anyway, right? It's not like it's going to be something that you jump into because a lot of people say, "I'll get to it. I'll get to it another day. I'll get to it when I'm when I'm done with weddings or I'm done with portraits or whatever it is." And they just sort of stall. You know, what what advice would you? I know you've talked about heart and soul and 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 really finding the time. But what other piece of advice would you say? You know, you got to do this. You know, you've got to be able to step up and do this yep. uh, because it, it helps you in the now. I mean, people forget it. That's what it is really meant for, right? I think the biggest thing is is maintaining a level of accountability. Yeah. Um, once per quarter. That's, I think, minimum. Minimum. Mark that day on your calendar. Um, plan it two months in advance. Block it off. You know, um, I, One of my mentors, John Michael Cooper, he's a huge proponent of personal projects as well. Sure. Yeah. And he goes out and shoots cars in the desert. And um, I remember speaking with him about two years ago and he you know it's easy to neglect that and it's his wife actually forced Delissa yeah. actually uh, forces him to that time off because he knows you know hey, John you're getting grouchy, grouchy or my wife will probably say the same thing so I think if you look at it okay it's 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 once a quarter and it gives you some buffer time to play with um, you know a couple weeks here and there 
Um, but there's no excuse that you know you can't find that time, um, and especially if you can incorporate friends with the experience and make it a together thing, whether it be you know a pictage pug meeting we're going to do create something or um, going out to the desert after a wedding, you know, in California or something like that. Sure. Big, yeah. Awesome. Well, RJ, thank you so much for all your all your pieces of advice and and, and tips on and just pursuing a personal projects uh, on. Uh, on your time, on your dime, you know, it's really amazing to see uh, how, especially this particular project I'm looking at, uh, is is sort of, it's so different that people, you have to, people have to take notice of you now, you know, almost, right? Well, you know, I'd like, I'd like to deflect a lot of the attention, but they have to take, I like more notice to be paid towards the actual prints. And that's something that sure. you've seen the work on the walls, yeah. but I think at the end of the day, we are judged by our prints. And um, behind me here, I don't know if I you see, see there's see actually it. two prints. Um, and you know, there's a difference between having a small little print like this um, versus you've got mammoth four foot by six foot prints. And um, in a gallery construct, that's really, I want to get that work out there in the world Absolutely. and uh, continue shooting that. Yeah, so that's a big part of it. Um, and, and realizing too, as a business person, um, that moment as an artist, we start having that dialogue with clients about how much is something, which is easy to do as a wedding photographer, portrait photographer, like this is what my services are, right? But that moment that conversation happens over art, it becomes a commodity. And I mean, as you know, art is worth nothing. At the same time, art can be worth millions. Sure. And so involving and delegating a gallery to help sell your work, um, that's, been, that's been really, that's been amazing. Um, and that's been, there's been a nice feedback loop too back into my wedding business. I was like, how can I deflect some of those conversations where you know, I'm not speaking directly with a client about pricing, uh, but there's cir other circular ways that then, you know, the artist isn't treated as a commodity. And that's sure. huge. Sure. So if I'm hearing you right, uh, is that, you know, if you are working with a wedding photographer, a wedding client, um, and they start to talk about, you know, their collections and their pricing or whatever, do you then talk about at some point or do they or do you refer to your artwork at some point so they get a, a sense of like, OK, wow, his artwork is, you know, worth thousands of more dollars so we're actually getting uh some sort of a break or is, is that what you mean or do you mean you mean something I don't else should, i don't push it too much in that way i mean at the end of the day it's about trust yeah right? um yeah. here's what my work looks like in its final form you're, you're hiring me based off of that i'm going to try to produce that quality of ah, work okay, um, with your personal point right Okay. Um, I, th I think there's roundabout ways, for example, sending a custom proposal via uh, Britain um, in, via email versus negotiating over the phone. You know? uh, little, those types of sales tactics, I think, are important. I think not even talking about pricing right off the beginning in a relationship, because it's, it's almost like a first date. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so you, you want to treat it like a courtship and make that really try to understand, are we the right fit? Yeah. Um, and it's no different than art buying is it's it's an emotional purchase and if you fail to realize like people don't need art on the wall but then they'll justify spending twenty thousand dollars on a painting or a piece of sculpture that they just have to have they can't live without um, I think that is a very powerful model that we can use in our own wedding photography is hey, get getting to know the couple why are they choosing to marry each other that's huge um, that's opening up some emotional heartstrings. Sure. Um, you know, tell me about how you propose. You know, those type getting to know things, and then you know, then when you have that conversation, you're like, okay, are we a good fit? You know, do we get along? Is this like a relationship? And then that makes the pricing component. Granted, it's it's always a criteria, right? Money doesn't grow on trees per se, but sure. um, uh, the, the clients can see the value in that. Awesome, great. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate that. Um, once again, this is RJ Kern from Minneapolis, a wedding photographer who does some amazing personal projects as well on his time away from his studio. Thanks again for joining us today, RJ. Thanks, Seishu. All Thanks. right. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye.